welcome to the AIPCT. This is a residency lecture, short, although the residency was. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we will ever be able to get Robin Friedman here again, I do not know. Um, and so we needed to take full advantage of his attendance of the wonderfully organized and hugely successful Dewey Conference that happened over the last uh, few days at SIU Carbondale due to uh, the diligent efforts of our colleague, Matthew Brown. Now, uh, that said, um, we're recovering. <laughs> Everybody pretty much here is recovering, and so uh, uh, since we're in recovery tonight, we'll, we'll consist of 12 steps. Um, first step is that I introduce Robin, and then he takes the rest of them. Um, uh, but uh, I first met Robin, uh, I think it was in Cincinnati, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah but, that's... But, but I knew about you before then. Because Robin is an independent scholar, uh, his uh, um, uh, active life was as a uh, uh, as a lawyer for the federal government right. and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So there's a couple of books to be written there, <laughs> which he which he's promised he'll write. Um, <laughs> but uh, but in any case, he had studied philosophy back in his student days. Uh, that was the late 19th century, um, and uh, <laughs> he was able to study with a young John Dewey. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, Robin went to graduate school as well, um, but uh, uh, law seemed more practical, and uh, so he had to delay his philosophy career for about 40 years. Yep. So, so, uh, uh, so in any case, uh, but he's back to it, and he went back to it. You retired early. A little bit. Yeah, uh, 63 or something, but, uh, 63, that's not but now so you've had worried. almost a full academic career, um, uh, uh, and the way I became aware of you was that you wrote long, detailed, and accurate, as well as critical reviews of, it, of every book that comes out. <laughs> Um, he's, he's a golden reviewer on uh, Amazon and Goodreads and, you know, he has the highest accolades of, for having reviewed the most books and mostly what he, he reviews a lot of different kinds of books, but he reviews a lot of philosophy books and he, re, and he reviews the kind of philosophy books I care about and the kind that I read. And then he, then he started reviewing mine and then we almost weren't friends. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but there's an honest, clear, critical eye uh, that he brings to... Uh, everything and, and the honesty part is what I appreciate the most especially when you re reviewed my rock and roll book and he'd never heard of most of the people I was talking about because Robin likes <laughs> loves classical music and is a very uh, accomplished and is a very accomplished pianist uh, uh, but uh, that said um, uh, in his review of my rock and roll book he says I don't have any idea who he's talking about but the philosophy <laughs> but the philosophy looks semi interesting Thank, thanks, Robin. Uh, that's, that, well, sold me, that sold me some books. Uh, that, that was me. Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to be honest, right? And that's what I appreciate most. Uh, Robin uh, has become particularly interested in classical American philosophy, especially American idealism, but that has tended to spread out into other things, including John Dewey uh, in the recent past and also... You've been sort of hanging with Paul Weiss for a while. Uh, I see him at the Metaphysical Society of America, and when the Royce Society meets, Royce is usually Royce. Is, Robin is usually there. Well, Royce himself is usually there. Um, and so uh, the work he has been doing is delightful. Uh, he looks at a lot of things uh, closely in a scholarly way that, that a lot of people feel they don't have time to look at, and Paul Weiss is one of those, and so I'm going to let him tell you about Paul Weiss, but I will say that everything Paul Weiss ever wrote is in this house, and his papers are at Morris Library. He was, during his lifetime, an incredibly important philosopher. He was on national TV all the time. He was the kind of person that the news channels went to when they needed a philosopher. And, uh, and so uh, sometimes he looked pretty good on national TV, and sometimes, sometimes he looked bad. Not so good. <laughs> yeah, especially when he got into an argument with James Baldwin. Uh, okay, I'm glad you all know about that. <laughs> James Baldwin, the argument with James Baldwin did not go well for Paul Weiss. Um, uh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, he was important enough that the nation listened to him as a philosopher, and in some ways, he filled the role that John Dewey had had earlier in the century as, you know, when the news stations wanted to go to somebody. I realize most of you probably have never heard of Paul Weiss, but 
SIU Press published most of his most of his works, and so I'll pull them out when this is all done. But so with that said, you're going to tell us a lot about this guy, and uh, I hope so. And most of us don't know anything about him, so it's going to be pretty much new for everybody. Yeah, so, that's an advantage, you love. Know. Yeah, it's an advantage. You could be dead wrong, and nobody's even going to know it. <laughs> all right. So uh, please make Robin feel welcome. Thank you. Well, you've done that already. I'm so glad you could come and learn a little bit about Paul Weiss with me. Uh, this paper is called Paul Weiss Revisited. Uh, introduction. At the 2022 annual meeting of the Metaphysical Society of America with the theme Metaphysical Traditions in Dialogue, I gave a presentation titled Paul Weiss and the Nature of Metaphysical Dialogue. At the conclusion of the presentation, the noted philosopher Robert Neville, a former doctoral student of Weiss, asked me, he said, you have given a good introduction to the thought of Paul Weiss, but what about you? What do you think? What is your view of Weiss? I want to try at the outset of this presentation to give a fuller answer to Professor Neville than I was able to muster at the MSA meeting of about two years ago. Over his long life, and Weiss lived from 1901 to 2002, Weiss practiced a broad systematic metaphysics that understandably has had few followers. It is part of Weiss's thought that he wanted individuals to reflect on questions of philosophy for themselves rather than to follow the thinking of another. For me, studying Weiss has been important on an individual level because I have wanted to get to know his thought for a long time. I have sympathy with his background and experience, which makes me feel at some level that I know where he is coming from. This is important in thinking about a philosopher. On a broader level, there is much to be learned about American philosophy and about philosophy in general from Weiss. American philosophy has often been divided into two camps, with analytically oriented philosophers on one side and continentally influenced thinkers on the other side. This divide has always been an oversimplification. It does not cover the many forms of philosophy that were practiced even during the time the analytic continental divide was in its heyday and that still are practiced. Metaphysical thinking has made something of a resurgence in contemporary philosophy and has throughout been part of the American philosophical practice, as the example of Paul Weiss, among others, makes clear. To make a related point, there is a tendency to see philosophical thought at any given time through the words of a few representative individuals. For example, Weiss's best-known student, Richard Rorty, saw Ludwig Wittgenstein, Martin Heidegger, and John Dewey as the crucial representative figures of 20th century thought. Uh, this focus on a small group of historical individuals, such as Kant, Descartes, Hume, and the like, in addition to those already mentioned, tends to overlook the collaborative nature of philosophical thinking, as philosopher George Lucas emphasizes in his reading recent book, The Ordering of Time, Meditations on the History of Philosophy. Contemporary philosophers have made efforts to include women, African Americans, and other marginalized groups, but the underlying issue is broader and includes philosophers whose work remains somewhat out of the mainstream, including the thought of Weiss. In fact, Lucas gives a great deal of attention to Weiss and to his mentor Whitehead in his book as examples of the collaborative nature of philosophy and of philosophy's use of its history. Most importantly, Weiss's conception of philosophy is the attempt by finite, limited individuals to question and to search for the nature of reality continues to be valuable and, and inspiring, and independently of the way Weiss resolved these issues for himself. I am reminded of the thought of Peirce, another key influence on Weiss, and his view of truth among disinterested seekers as the goal of inquiry. And pertinent to Weiss, Lucas draws an analogy between the philosophical search for truth 
and the use of commentary in the Jewish tradition. Uh, in the tradition, the Torah, first five books of the Bible, is given as the revealed word of God with the many commentaries over the years, over the generations, interpreting and expanding upon its meaning. The commentaries try to avoid the subjectivity inherent in this approach because they are directed outside the inter interpreter to what the Jewish tradition understands as the revealed word of God. So too, philosophical thought is directed in the work of Weiss to the nature of reality, which different thinkers working together seek to better understand in order to live a full human life. It is a, not a matter of uh, a view such as it is all interpretation. Thought for Weiss is directed and tested by reality and by the collaborative contributions of others. I have learned from Weiss something important about the nature of philosophy and about the nurture of the search for truth in philosophy, and I have learned as well from some of his individual books. This would be the nub of my response to the question Professor Neville asked me at the MSA meeting of about two years ago, and you prob it kind of distinguishes, if you will, between metaphysics or philosophy and metaf metaphysics or meta-philosophy, meta or as it's sometimes called, the philosophy of philosophy. Uh, I will expand upon the response in the following presentation. Part one considers broadly Weiss' life and work, while part two focuses more on some of his metaphysical thought. Part one, Weiss's life and conception of philosophy. I am honored to speak to you all today before the AIPCT, I want to thank Randy for inviting me here, for making me a fellow, and for encouraging my efforts in philosophy beginning in 2013 when he contacted me after I reviewed his book on Josiah Royce, Time, Will, and Purpose on Amazon. I have learned a great deal from Randy over the years and his often combative, cantankerous style sometimes reminds me of Weiss. Randy tells the story of how as an undergrad graduate, he browsed through the philosophy section of his university library, found books by Alfred North Whitehead, and was hooked for a lifetime. I had a somewhat similar browsing experience some years earlier than Randy, since I'm older, when as a young undergraduate in philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I also browsed the library shelves and found both Whitehead and his former do doctoral student. Paul Weiss. I was fascinated in part because out, it was outside the scope of what I was taught at the time, but I did not pursue these thinkers then with the in intensity that Randy pursued Whitehead. During my sophomore year, Weiss came to UWM and gave a presentation to the philosophy department and its students. I remember meeting him and asking him a question. One of the department members said after Weiss's talk, I didn't think there were philosophers like that around anymore. <laughs> I learned a great deal from my undergraduate teachers. Several encouraged my interest in Whitehead while being skeptical about Weiss. There are many ways to learn to think reflectively and philosoph philosophically. To the extent that Weiss is remembered today, it's been mentioned here at, twice already, it is through one of his less stellar moments. On June 13, 1968, Weiss appeared on the Dick Cabot television show together with James Baldwin. The discussion between Weiss and Baldwin soon became heated. Weiss criticized Baldwin for what he thought was Baldwin's exclusive focus on race to the neglect of other parts, both of the indi his individual experience and of the African-American experience including Baldwin's own success as a writer. As Baldwin made eloquently clear, Weiss lacked appreciation of black history in America or of the nature of the black experience. My history in America begins with a bill, bill of sale, Baldwin said in his passionate response to Weiss. Ba Baldwin said, you want me to make an act of faith risking myself my wife, my woman, my sisters, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, but which I have never seen. Weiss was uncharacteristically left speechless. The Baldwin Exchange is eager, eager, easily accessible on YouTube, 
and was featured in a 2016 documentary film on Baldwin, directed by Raoul Peck, called I Am Not Your Negro. In ex his exchange with Weiss, Baldwin emphasized the importance of his background in growing up black in Harlem in understanding his own experience and the experience of African Americans. And so it is with Weiss as well, and with the important Weiss's importance Weiss's thought gives to the experience of the individual engaged in philosophical reflection. Much later in his life, in Weiss's autobiographic autobiography, which is going to be discussed throughout this paper, uh, Weiss expressed regret about not giving racism and other pressing social issues more attention in his philosophy. Weiss wrote, I have not paid sufficient attention to the philosophic issues raised by technology, economics, current affairs, poverty, racism, or war. A strong attempt to understand these and other neglected topics without trying to fit them within the compass of what had already been maintained would perhaps reveal an incompleteness in what had been maintained. Conceivably, they might require a revision or transformative additions to what had been held by me for decades. Whether or not what I had maintained is sustained, modified, or discarded by what such inquiries make evident, other explorations of these and other areas would undoubtedly promote the understanding of what is, as well as what can be known about reality. So I take that passage as kind of Weiss reflecting on his exchange with Baldwin and other similar matters that really don't find much of a place in his thought. My presentation tonight draws heavily on the Library of Living Philosophers volume, The Philosophy of Paul Weiss, particularly Weiss's autobiographical essay, which I just quoted, called Lost in Thought, Alone with Others, which opens the book. Lost in thought. Lo yeah, lost it's in thought. Like lost. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, Weiss's autobiographical essay is one of his best writings, with its highly characteristic mix of the personal and particular and the dizzyingly abstract. The autobiography is in two parts in which Weiss explores his philosophical life from two perspectives. The first part is titled more or less chronological, while the second is called more or less analytical. For Weiss, philosophy begins in actualities, the world of everyday objects and common sense. It moves beyond them to more ultimate concerns through a process of relentless questioning. Accordingly, his intellectual autobiography begins with a brief story of his childhood. He begins with the story of how, even as a child, he tended to ask difficult questions which could not be satisfactorily answered. Weiss was the son of poor Jewish immigrants who lived in a tenement in Manhattan's storied Lower East Side, which at the time Weiss lived was the, the home for many immigrants, uh, primarily Jewish, but other groups as well. Uh, th this background is not entirely mine, but it made me feel some immediate connection with Weiss. His family generally adhered to the practices of Orthodox Judaism. Uh, Weiss wrote eloquently about religion, as we shall see later in the paper, but after he left home, he was never a practicing Jew or an adherent of any other religion. And we're going to talk about one of Weiss, a couple of Weiss's books about God, and it's an open question about whether Weiss is a theist or not when you get to it all. Uh, for some years, Weiss lived a scrappy, street-smart life. He enrolled in a commercial high school after dropping out of school, but he dropped out of the commercial high school as well. He held low-level le commercial jobs, including work as a messenger and then as, as a stenographer at Madison Square Garden, where he learned to box. During this time, Weiss read widely but unsystematically. At the age of 22, he found his way to the City College of New York, which at the time offered free tuition to its students, who were almost entirely the children of Jewish immigrants. He met his first great mentor, the famed philosopher Morris Raphael Kuhn, and received his first uh, 
exposure to the work of Whitehead. Weiss went to graduate school at Harvard because he wanted to study with Whitehead, even though Morris Cohen advised him to study with Dewey at Columbia. <laughs> he studied with many famous teachers and engaged, and engaged with fellow students who would have distinguished careers, including W. Leo Quine, who would take philosophy in an entirely different direction from Weiss. At Harvard, differed from many of his fellow students in his Lower East Side Jewish background and in his poverty. The Whiteheads, particularly Evelyn Whitehead, with their patrician English background, took an interest in their student, and they tried in subtle ways to help Weiss financially and also to smooth out some of his rough edges, including his frequent tactlessness. During his graduate years, Weiss was also influenced by the historian of philosophy, Eddie N. Gilson, and subsequently studied with Gilson in Europe after receiving his Ph.D. Weiss worked with his slightly old, older colleague, Charles Hartshorn, as you all probably know, in editing the first collected edition of the works of Charles Peirce. Weiss regarded Peirce as the greatest American philosopher and as I've already suggested, Peirce's influence is very strong in, in, in Weiss's own work. In his autobiography, Weiss discussed the importance of an individual's background in the formulation of a philosophy. Weiss wrote, One does not, in a philosophy, should not acknowledge this, lose all contact with what is real just by speaking or thinking. The acknowledgment of that obvious truth requires one to know that wherever speculations lead, one remains an individual person, both apart from and able to be related to others. Pre-philosophical beginnings are deepened when they are being departed from, thereby giving what is reached an import it would not otherwise have. Officially beginning with attenuated versions of what is daily accepted, a philosophy for may indeed should move from the familiar without losing all hold on it. The insistence that the philosopher remains an individual person in his or her reflections is itself crucial to establishing the nature and never-ending task of philosophy <laughs> and the continued need to formulate and test one's thought through discussion with others. In 1946, after he had completed his PhD and been to Europe, Weiss held a position at Bryn Mawr. He had already published substantially and required what would be a lifelong reputation as a provocative, inspiring teacher. Weiss accepted an interim appointment at Yale to substitute for the idealist philosopher Brand Blanchard. Blanchard and Weiss both shared a commitment to large-scale systematic philosophical thinking that cut against the positivistic or analytical thinking of the day. The following year, with Blanchard's support, Weiss received a tenured position at Yale where he taught philosophy for more than 20 years. Weiss became the first tenured Jewish faculty member at Yale. His appointment had been controversial both within the philosophy department and within the larger university, as Yale had at the time a well-earned reputation for anti-Semitism. Weiss ultimately rose to become the sterling professor of philosophy. The Sterling Professorship has Yale's highest academic rank awarded to the tenured faculty member considered the best in their field. Weiss taught at Yale until 1969. He taught at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., where he won an age discrimination case when the department declined to renew his contract until he retired voluntarily in 1994. I might say, as did, as did John Dewey, Weiss remained active and productive until the end of uh, what proved to be a long life. I lived in Washington, D.C. through the tenure, years of Weiss's tenure at Catholic, but was occupied with the practice of law, as Mandy's pointed out, and with raising a family, and I had no contact with him. I did take several graduate courses during these years at Catholic University, uh, but never with Paul Weiss. Uh, Weiss's continuing activity in old age in itself remains daunting and inspiring to my own efforts in continuing this study. 
Weiss's many books can be dis divided into three categories. First, Weiss wrote extensively on broad metaphysical questions and was a system builder in books such as Modes of Being, written in 1958, First Considerations in 1977, and Being in Other Realities, written in 1995. Second, Weiss wrote many books attempting to apply his metaphysics to various important dimensions or activities of human life. He wrote on subjects such as art, politics, and society, history, and was one of the first philosophers to write on the philosophy of sport. Uh, third, for many years, Weiss kept a day-to-day -day record of his philosophical thinking and activities, making a unique record of personal philosophical reflection. These reflections were ultimately published in 12 volumes under the title Philosophy in Process. I want to talk about briefly a book in the second category of those that I mentioned to begin. Weiss's highly personal book, The God We Seek, written in 1964, belongs to the second group of Weiss's writings. It is part of a group of venerable 20th century writings by American philosophers on God and religion, which includes works by Peirce, James, Royce, Hawking, Dewey, Whitehead, Hartshorn, among others, and it is worthy of their company. Hartshorn, I think, rightly regarded it as the best of Weiss's book. Weiss's book describes the communal and the individual search for God, which in his words is tortuous and troubled. The search for God is part of human experience, but God cannot be captured in any individual experience or in any particular religion. Much of Weiss's book, particularly the, the, the early chapters, is effectively a phenomenological description of the search for God. The primary, uh, as Hartshorn pointed out in his review, uh, with all his uh, argumentation and med uh, seeming argumentation, what Weiss is sometimes is his best when he does other things. And in uh, Common Faith, a, a lot of it is a very eloquent des description of how people tend to reach beyond their individual experience in the search for God. Uh, the primary question driving the book is how God can be searched for and worshipped individually or within specific religious traditions without derogating the searches or the religious traditions of others. Weiss's book is divided into three sections titled Experience, the Sacred, and the Quest. The heart of the book, for me, is this discussion in part two of what Weiss calls the dedicated community, which bears comparison and contrasting with the concept of the, broad, of the beloved community, uh, which was developed uh, by Josiah Royce and uh, also perhaps by Dewey. Uh, Weiss has a section in part two called The Completing, Competing Claims of the Various Religions, where Weiss tries to show how there can be a plurality of dedicated communities, each with, each with their own traditions, their sacred books, their customs, their histories, their venerated objects, and the like. Uh, how there can be a plurality of dedicated communities such as that and approaches to God without the community, communities fighting with or hating one another, still a highly apropos topic. Weiss offers a, an extended discussion of Judaism among, among much else in this section, which to my knowledge is his longest published consideration of his birth religion. And in part three, he movingly explores the private character of religion and of religious faith. The God we seek will reward study, even though it has largely been forgotten, together with the rest of Weiss's books. Among his other activities, Weiss at Yale founded a philosophical journal, The Review of Metaphysics, to create an outlet for dissident views in philosophy against the current views of positivism or pragmatism. In 1950, Weiss founded the Metaphysical Society, where I spoke at Weiss, as I mentioned, in 2022. 
<clears throat> for the purpose, in his words, of promoting the study of reality by philosophers of all persuasions, independent of faction. At the MSA's first meeting held at Yale uh, on April 15, 1950, Weiss gave an inaugural address titled The Fourfold Art of Avoiding Questions, which casts light on Weiss's understanding of the nature of philosophy. In Weiss's words, the distinguished scholars participating in that first MSA meeting constituted a group which cut across school, creed, doctrine, and nation for the purpose of promoting truth, regardless of where it may lead. Weiss characterized the state of philosophy at the mid-20th century as an attempt to avoid consideration of the best basic questions common to mankind that it was the role of philosophical thinkers to address. He found that contemporary philosophers had avoided these questions by following one of four routes, which he termed the geographic, historic, methodological, and dogmatic. As to the first, Weiss discussed how some American thinkers appeared enthralled to various schools and movements, with the result that we in this country have been slack in the, produce of, in the pursuit of what he termed cosmic truth. So too, Weiss criticized philosophers who limited their thought to a particular hist historical period. He wrote that, he who tries to force inquiry into the pattern forged by men of some previous age belies what they themselves set out to do and defrauds future generations of the fruits which might be won today. Weiss directed his strongest criticism to what he called the methodologic and dogmatic attempts to avoid metaphysical questions. The two run together in Weiss's analysis. His critique points to the need for many competing metaphysical approaches and for discussion among them in order to understand and approach the truth. His discussion of the methodological way of avoidance deserves quotation in full for the light it casts on the nature of metaphysics and on the centrality to the search of truth of discussion amongst various metaphysical traditions. And he said, the characteristic American way of avoiding hard questions, one is tempted to say our contribution to this art, is to insist upon one method, say that of pragmatism, instrumentalism, idealism, analysis, linguistics, or logistics, and to deny the importance or meaningfulness of anything which lies beyond its scope or power. But we have been given no assurance by fact or dialectic that the mysteries to which beset us are to be solved in only one way. We need not one but many methods, not one but hundreds of school, or better, we must avoid prescribed methods, limitative schools and programs, and instead invite a host of independent inquirers to submit to one another's criticism the product of their honest thought. No man or school has mastered all the ways by which we can learn what we should. He who approaches issues from only one direction denies himself and us the truths that require another approach. Weiss then applied this critique to dogmatic positions in philosophy, which he claimed in the name of science, logic, God, economics, or logic, deny the meaning of any questions which cannot fit inside the limits they have set as defining the nature of meaning and the possibility of being. For Weiss, various philosophical dogmatists rejected metaphysical dialogue because they arbitrarily believed that their own system, whether say scientific, Marxist, or Kierkegaardian, constituted the only path to truth. Weiss concluded his inaugural address with Pierce's dictum that the one great intellectual crime was blocking the road of inquiry which we've heard several times in the past few days talking about Dewey. He issued a stirring call for the end of the fourfold art of avoiding questions so that philosophers could again explore different approaches to lasting, difficult, and fundamental matters, including the nature and relation of being and non-being, God in the world, time and eternity, good and bad, logic and existence, the individual and the totality. We have explored in this part one 
Weiss's life and work, using his autobiography as our primary guide to show how Weiss understood philosophy as both involving the broadest search for truth and is necessarily personal, as practiced by finite, limited persons, each with their own history and nature. In the next section of the presentation, we examine some of the more of the specifics of Weiss's thought. So, part two, Weiss's philosophy. Uh, by all accounts, Weiss was a grand systematizer. His philosophy rejected the anti-metaphysical tendencies of 20th century philosophy, including analytic philosophy, pragmatism, I'm sorry, positivism, and much of pragmatism and existentialism. This form of philosophy was not as uncommon in 20th century American thought as is sometimes supposed. Examples that we've given are Brad Blanchard, for whom Weiss substituted Yale, and of course Whitehead, Weiss's teacher and mentor. Weiss, however, largely rejected the process philosophy, which has become perhaps the leading form of speculative philosophy in America. Instead, beginning with his first book, Realities, which was written in Reality, which was written in 1938, Weiss developed a substantialist philosophy based upon actualities, the reality of individual objects, and upon the need to penetrate to the deeper realities of these objects through a form of knowledge that he called following purse adumbration. The process of adumbration remains mysterious to most readers. It has links to the transcendental philosophy of Kant or Hegel. White wrote in his autobiography, I have tried to show that one may pass beyond the surface of actualities by carrying out intensive adumbrative acts. If this is done, it is possible to take account of individuals persons, characters, consciousness, emotions, responsibility, and judgment. These, with other dimensions of individual persons, escape the reach of studies that, con that concentrate on interplaying or encountering transient realities. It is valuable to be reminded of other American systematic thinkers, particularly, in my view, Josiah Royce, and his student and philosopher in his own right, Jacob Lowenberg. As did Weiss, Lowenberg had strong Jewish immigrant roots. He came to the United States as a young man, almost penniless, to earn his Ph.D. with Royce. In 1955, in celebration of the centennial of Royce's birth, Lowenberg wrote an essay about his teacher and mentor titled Royce's Synoptic Vision, in which Lowenberg contrasted Royce as a synthetic thinker which means a builder uh, with the anal analytic philosophy of his, today, of his day, which endeavored to divide and reuse, reduce reality and to understand it in smaller components. Lohenberg wrote, Royce's philosophic genius may be said to find its most distinct expression in synoptic vision, in the ability to see together and as related things apparently divided and distinct. Lohenberg's depiction of Royce as a thinker of synoptic vision applies with at least as much force to the thought of Paul Weiss. Much of Weiss can be understood as exploring and expanding upon the Greek philosophical question of the one and the many and of the relationship of the one and the many. I want to identify five characteristics of Weiss's philosophy that I gleaned from his biography, which is a Weissian thing to do, making lists of categories. First, Weiss's thought arose from what he described as the relentless questioning of his experiences of what he was told and of what he saw. Philosophy for Weiss involved the question of asking of questions of a broad fundamental scope with the lasting questions themselves always more important than the tentative answers, including Weiss's own tentative answers. Second, for Weiss, philosophy was broad and systematic. It asked questions about the fundamental nature of reality and about the interrelationship of different parts of reality. Third, even with its broad systematic grand scope, philosophy was necessarily individual, 
as Weiss recognized, his thought and the thinking of every reflective person was based upon his own experience, perspective, and background on his private character. His thought, as did that of every other thinker, encompassed his own limitation, fallibility, and mortality. Fourth, Weiss viewed metaphysics as always starting afresh. Weiss claimed that he rarely revisited his earlier writings. Each of his several books on metaphysics was begun and thought through using the insights and expanded questions Weiss hoped he had gained from his prior reflections. Although Weiss believed there was a continuity in the questions he raised from one book to another, he thought that each work stood on his own without building on his prior studies. Fifth, Weiss recognized that there were many ways of thinking about metaphysical questions and about understanding reality. The work of any thinker or philosophical tradition was subject to a never-ending process of clarification. For all the length and difficulty of his books, uh, Weiss could be at times pithy, and I wanted to put in some quotes from the autobiography to illustrate what I've been trying to say. From more or less chronological, Weiss wrote, Philosophy is the search for an all a final, all-comprehensive account, a human's attempt to grasp what only omniscience could fully comprehend. A never-ending pursuit, it is hoped that later thinkers might use what is now done as a starting point and as a corrective. One who does this will exhibit the spirit that animates scientists and other dedicated inquirers to a degree and in a manner nothing else could. Then he says... I think there is a thread running through all my writings, but I am not confident that it is worth isolating unless it be continued, snipped off, or modified preparatory to finding and using a better thread. I have one object in mind, to understand the pluralistic scheme of things, the singular this presupposes, and the unity that permits them to be both apart and separate from one another. And then he says, and this is a comment uh, very apt to what we're going to see later that that people are tempted to bring right away as criticism of Weiss. Occam's law is odios. No responsible thinker multiplies laws beyond necessity. Rather, almost everyone ignores some and too often precludes the understanding of those that are irreducible, persistent, and presupposed in an intelligible, systematic account of what could be real. Uh, For more or less analytical, Weiss says, there is no one predetermined way to move from the finite and the incomplete to what is perfect and forever, or conversely. A comprehensive account is the outcome of a series of advances of retreats, acceptances countered by rejections, examinations followed by leaps, and the outcome of these prompting new probings. What philosophy seeks to know is what already is, but not yet clarified or articulated. Moving along, uh, in 1977, Weiss wrote a metaphysical treatise titled First Considerations. In this book, Weiss distinguishes two types of realities, which he terms actualities and finalities. The five finalities in Weiss's thought at this point are substance, being, possibility, existence, and unity. You write it down because it's going to be a quiz afterwards. (laughs) Weiss's goal is to explain the nature of both the actualities and the finalities and the nature of man in the moral life as it floats amongst them. In an insightful chapter, The Task of Philosophy, Weiss sets out his understanding of what philosophy is to do. Philosophy is neither science nor math, mathematics, but is instead a self-critical quest for what is real. Uh, Paragraph 15 of this chapter is important in understanding how Weiss views philosophy. Because of this book's almost total unfamiliarity, I will quote it here. Weiss says, Since every man is unavoidably the product of his time, culture, and studies, 
since at his best he is confused, ignorant, biased, limited in vision and insight, in short, finite as to mind and body, none can ever hope to achieve a perfect, all-encompassing, neutral, articulate account. No man, not even a multiplicity of them, could forge a fully satisfactory systematic philosophy which was without serious flaw or omission. But the effort must be made. Not only is it desirable to try to push back the limits within which one had unreflectively lived, to try to avoid arbitrarily assuming what should have been examined, and to try to reduce the number of unreliable, derivative, unexplained, and unexamined judgments that are made, but it is good to expose to the critical eye of others, and hopefully to one's own at some latter time, the weaknesses as well as the promises of a philosophy, and thereby alert all to what next should arrest attention. The unique final section of the book, First Considerations, consists of comments on the book by six philosophers and Weiss's responses. Most of the commentators show sympathy with Weiss's broad conception of philosophy while objecting tellingly to his way of carrying it out. Among the commenters was Weiss's most famous doctoral student, Richard Rorty. Within two years of first considerations, Rorty would publish his famous book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, which rejects philosophical attempts at a metaphysical understanding of reality that are far more modest than those of his teacher. As often happens in philosophy, Weiss and his student took seemingly polar opposite po uh, positions, even though in my review, Rorty himself remains something of a metaphysician more than he's credited for. It would be interesting to look into sometime what Rorty may have learned and not learned from Weiss. I'm not sure that's been done. Of his several books of systematic metaphysics, Weiss thought the best was Being in Other Realities, written in 1995, because, as he stated in his autobiography, autobiography it deals in a fresh, systematic, pluralistic way with I th what I think are the perennial basic issues. The work is daunting and frequently abstract and obscure. As often with Weiss, the book is a challenging mixture of abstract discussion with uh, some surprisingly pointed and personal observation, which for me are almost always the better parts of the books when he speaks in a very concrete, individual way. Uh, I will not attempt to summarize BOR in its entirety or to defend its approach. My goal is to show how Weiss saw philosophy as an ever-ending project to understand reality and the human place in it, and to view philosophy, importantly, as something to be lived. Uh, Weiss would feel at home in the philosophy as a way of life school that probably many people here know. Consider the title Being in Other Realities, which aptly suggests much of the content of the book. Weiss is concerned with the nature of all-encompassing being, which is often devalued or treated hermeneutically in contemporary thought. And as you know, uh, well, Heidegger talks of being, there's other philosophers such as Wein's, uh, Weiss's former fellow student, Quine, who, who do something different with it. And Quine famously saying, being is the val to be is to be the value of variable, which is deflationary. And I think Pierce would agree with Weiss about being. People might disagree with that. Anyway, being is a central category in Weiss's thought, but he doesn't stop there. His book explores other realities in addition to being, that with a capital B, of course, thus suggesting that a focus on being is not enough and that there are other realities which, while, while they are encompassed in being, also have an identity of their own and must be considered separately. The title suggests both metaphysical pluralism and a plurality of approach to being and to other realities. And in the preface to the book, Weiss says that the work is best raised, at, best read as a proposed map of all reality 
and is best tested by seeing how it meets the challenges? Does it squarely face and answer the questions that a claimed comprehensive account of reality raises? Could it be lived? Again, Weiss's philosophy combines an attempt at the greatest breadth with the most highly personal and particular to wit, could it be lived? Weiss begins with a discussion of four actualities in what he finds are four dim distinct domains, uh, very obscure stuff. The first, the humanized world, is the world of human beings in their common life. For Weiss, the humanized world is the focus of pragmatism and of how people get along with one another. The second domain is occupied by humans, persons, individuals. It differs from the first because it consists of private individuals, each with his or her own character and distinctiveness. So Weiss divides human beings into two parts. There's the social part, common part, that is basically studied by pragmatism for him. And there's a very deep individual part. Each individual is a microcosm and a person of oneself uh, that, that you really can't get to. It. It's a very private thing. Uh, some people might contest that as well, but he does talk a lot about individual privacy. The third actuality is the domain of nature. As Weiss says, the wind blows, the earth trembles, light fades, the seasons pass, flowers bloom, wild animals and thousands of other realities and occurrences come and go in nature, apparently without any regard for us. For Weiss, nature is known by its own distinctive space-time and causality, separate from that of the humanized or personal domains. The fourth domain is cosmos, which consists of unit actualities that science, particularly physicists and astronomers, endeavor to understand. The unit actualities pre-exist and form the objects of nature and of the humanized in an individualized domains. These four domains interact but are irreducible to one another. Philosophers err when they attempt to be reductive to apply the rules governing one domain to the remaining three domains. For example, physically and physicalistically inclined philosopher argue that actions in the three other domains reduce to the principles of the cosmic domain while biologically inclined thinkers might seek a reduction to naturalism. For Weiss, pragmatist philosophers describe well results in the humanized domain, but err in applying pragmatism to the three re remaining domains. Philosophical thinking for Weiss takes place in the personalized domain of private individuals. A source of philosophical error might be reducing other domains to the subjectivity of the personal domain. At least equally importantly, the personalized domain from which philosophizing arises suggests that philosophy is a fallible, finite enterprise that is subject to a multitude of approaches and to continuous modification. For Weiss, philosophy begins with but does not end in actualities. In B.O.R., Weiss begins with actualities and domains and works, as I've suggested, through his understanding of adumbration to find what actualities presuppose. The inquiry is a, essentially a two-step process uh, that leads Weiss to six ultimates, um, of which we've discussed four. The second upstep leads Weiss from the ultimates to an all-encompassing being, Weiss's presentation is highly obscure and abstract. My purpose is not to give a full exposition of Weiss or necessarily to defend everything in this approach. It is to show how Weiss conceives of the nature of philosophy and of how his understanding requires metaphysical pluralism in the sense of a variety of approaches to understanding. Uh, Weiss argues for six ultimates. Of these, each domain has one ultimate which takes the predominant role in understanding re the respective actualities, but each ultimate is to an extent involved in each domain. For present purposes of most interest are two of the remaining ultimates that I haven't mentioned, 
the dunamis, dunamis, and the rational. Uh, these ultimates play a subordinate role within each of the four, four domains. Their main role is to affect the transition from one domain to another, which means that how we can get and think of things, say, from humanistically to the world of nature, the cosmos and individuals, how are they all related to each other? Um, so one yeah. of these ways is the dunamis. Weiss describes the dunamis as free flow and movement analogous uh, very much to Bergson's Elan Vital. It plays for Weiss the predominant role in Eastern philosophy. Um, the rational, which is Weiss's other way of how people move from one domain thing to the other, um, more or less answers to the ideas of Plato, the forms of logic, the forms of Aristotle, and the categories, logics, and formulas of their successors. So the rational is how we think rational through logic and through trying to discover things. And that isn't the only way of knowing things. He has with the dunamis two different ways of knowing, knowing things. The neglect of one member of this pair or the other has prevented philosophers from realizing the strong relationship between their apparently competing views of reality. Conversely, the understanding of their interconnection will allow philosophers to better understand reality in its infinite complexity and also to understand each other. Weiss writes, the neglect of either of these ultimates or of them is intertwined has prevented rationalists and vitalists, thinkers and makers, epistemologists and ontologists from realizing how dependent they are on one another. In the later parts of B.O.R., Weiss describes philosophy in the terms of Heraclitus and consi as consisting of the way up and the way down. The way up takes the philosopher from individual actualities through the ultimates and ultimately to being. In the way down, for Weiss, the philosopher returns from being through the ultimates to the world of the everyday. The goal is the achievement of a living philosophy, which Weiss describes in various ways. It involves an understanding of one's life and of one's relationship to a broad reality and the living of an ethical life. This process Weiss describes as an unending task, which involves unrelenting self-examination, overcoming errors and presumptions, and the insights of individuals from a variety of perspectives and points of beginning. Weiss describes this unending task and its necessity necessity repetitively in many places in BOR. Here is an eloquent passage in which Weiss captures the need for a plethora of thought and philosophical voices. We could never know what an all comprehensive meeting point was until we knew all these parts and the contributions they make to the whole and knew that the whole is a whole for just these parts. The fact that what is partial can be completed does not mean that it disappears into what accepts it. This step, this word, this note continues to be distinctive all the while that it is caught up in a dance, a poem, or a song. Now that's eloquent and also fairly dark. Uh, what he means is that each person in each individual thing is both a unit and has individual characteristics and is also part of the very breadth of things, of the dance or the poem and song. Hence, Weiss tries to solve the problem of ancient philosophy of the one of the many and other problems. Each philosoph philosophical voice is an attempt at philosophical understanding, which is important and separate in itself and which also forms its part in a dance, a poem, or a song. Conclusion. Yes. In this paper, we have discussed the work of Paul Weiss, his view of the nature of philosophy, and his own philosophical thinking. In the first part, we consider Weiss's life and career, his role as the founder of journals and societies, and his understanding of the nature of philosophy. In the second part, we have seen how Weiss used his efforts as a founder 
in his own philosophical writings to de develop a large-scale philosophy of reality and of the human place in reality, which required never-ending revision through questioning and through consideration of many differing philosophical approaches. The goal of this presentation has not been to adopt Weiss's philosophy, but rather to use his work to encourage continued philosophical practice and reflection on the nature of philosophy and, in philo and on philosophy as, way, as a way of life. I am grateful that I've had the opportunity to discuss Paul Weiss with you all here tonight. So. Thanks, Robin. One of the things that I didn't mention when I was introducing you is uh, what a tenacious and loyal fellow you have been when it comes to, fellow of AIPCT, when it comes to the reading groups that we do here. Um, for those who don't know, we do reading groups pretty much every fall and spring and sometimes in the summer and sometimes over Christmas. And Robin attends them from Washington, D.C. and hurls grenades into them, oh. <laughs> um, but, uh, but very effective uh, uh, fragmentation and uh, uh, and sometimes, uh, what are those white grenades that uh, have the, the burn right through you? White or, phosphorus. Uh, the white, white phosphorus grenade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you tossed one or two of those at the Dewey Conference. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so in any case, uh, Robin's tough. <laughs> so, and so if you have any, uh, if you have any uh, hypercritical things to no, say. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> that's the yeah. reason. That's, uh, when uh, you get, you're a lawyer, I guess, that's like right. you <laughs> kind of develop a thick skin. As, uh, you know, you get called As the French <laughs> say, he's formidable. Uh, so, uh, so don't spare him. Uh, don't spare <laughs> Weiss, uh, even on the uh, Dick Cavett show. Uh, they certainly didn't spare him there. You know, it is funny because Paul Weiss was a brilliant man, but you got to watch that video if you haven't watched it. He was in over his head with James Paul. I mean, in way over his head. It was really something to watch. But part of it is, is that Robin, um, um, uh, he's, Paul Weiss likes to unfold things very gradually, and so he's pugnacious and tenacious and, uh, and certainly not afraid of an argument. But you've got to listen for a while before the argument takes form, and that's possibly the reason that somebody like James Baldwin would be. But anyway, so questions for Robert? I have, um, you mentioned that uh, Weiss was a uh, was more, mostly a substantivist. Yeah. I was wondering how uh, he then how he would handle the idea of possibility, and I think he said that was one of the ultimates. Um, the part problem I, is that. If you're stuck in substances, it seems like the only way you can deal with uh, 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 possibility it leads into something like um, uh, like possible world realism, which I dislike intensely. Um, I mean, possibilities have uh, kind of a, a, fa a penumbra around them. They, f they, kind of, they don't have a sharply defined edge, which it seems like is the kind of thing that a substance approach would require. And so I was curious how uh, Weiss, if Weiss addressed these and if he did how. I'm not really sure how to answer you. I'm not sure. I would think that he would, that he'd use what I call the, the dunamis and the rational as ways of, of dealing with, with possibilities. Um, he does combine a lot of things. He, he is a substantive this, but he, he also does a, try to incorporate quite a bit of Whitehead with, with change and flow and movement. So I, I think he tried to say that there are not as um, inconsistent from each other is yeah. your question might well, be supposed to I, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm I mean, not there, sure. There, I don't there, know what there have been answer. people who tried to argue that, that Whitehead was actually a substantivist because of his uh, attention to actual entities. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so, I mean, there's, I can, I, mean, I, I don't agree with that, that interpretation. But no, and I don't think Weiss would agree with it. But, but um, it just, I mean, I think so, the problem of possibility is something that Randy and I have been uh, chewing on like carriers of a dead rat for the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so is it's, it dead? I'm not sure it's dead. Well, if you shake, you shake it long enough, rats, you, shake, anyway. you shake it long enough, it'll 
<laughs> okay, carriage with a, with a rag doll, how's that? Okay. <laughs> um, competing over route. No, no, that's not much competition. We're just both chewing on it at the same time. But yeah, so I mean, when you mentioned that, that was the one that came to mind. So. And I'm not entirely sure how we would deal with that. Well, you mentioned the adumbration thing, and so it's like he, he gets out of it maybe by not expecting of his account, uh, his logos, that it, that it come to the kind of distinctiveness that mm. actuality has itself. Yeah, that could, you could, that mm. could be, that, that's, Boy, that's a, a very fuzzy concept. That's a dodge. He's dodging the question. <laughs> well, but I don't know, no more probably than other, than Kant. Or, mm. uh, it, it's basically a transcendental approach, it seems to me, if like Kant would ask, how is experience possible? You know, a question that, of course, many people would reject that. But Kant does it and comes up with his categories that view as space time. And it, it seems to me that adumbration does somewhat similar work for Weiss. He tries to look at experience and to say, if you look at it fully and holistically, you're going to see that it has all these elements to it. And they're, they're much more um, thing-like, shall I say, than, say, the categories of Kant are. I mean, the nature, individual persons, uh, humanized groups, and cosmos, at, at least in his final version of this. But uh, he says he learned it from Peirce, and I, I suspect that he did, in fact, because Peirce is more of a speculative thinker, I feel, than people given credit for being. Mm. Yes? Can I? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, I used to know something about Weiss, but that was a long time ago. So uh, let me uh, just, well, first of all, tell a, uh, a story and then um, I'll ask my question. Um, for many years, you know, I was uh, Secretary Treasurer of the Society for Advanced American Philosophy, and Weiss was a regular member and was pretty good about paying his dues, but he fell a couple of years behind. And I was about to remove him from the membership, but then uh, realized, uh, oh, he has to be retired. And so I changed his status to retired, which doesn't require any dues. And he wrote me a very curt note, says, I am not retired. I have no intention of ever retiring. Here's my check. And that was my <laughs> memorable kind of I'm still trying to get my head around, you know, how he deals then with the, uh, the, the perennial issue of the one and the many. Uh, you indicated that he was intensely in individualistic, uh, so it seemed, and yet he believed in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, ultimates and uh, um, uh, uh, all-encompassing being. So could you say more about how is it that everything gets held together in, you know, in this uh, pluralism and in unity. Okay, good luck. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe just ask, what's the nature of, relation, of relatedness in him? Because it sounds okay. a lot like external relatedness, which would be uncharacteristic of process thinkers. Yeah, that he does talk about. Um, all right. He, um, as I indicated, he does believe in some mysterious, all-encompassing being, which just to, to say, I, it, he doesn't equate with God. He says God is something, a matter for faith and not for philosophers. So his being does not have the, the character of God. But being is, is sort of in everything and the root of everything. But it has the these parts that I indicated, the, the four domains and then dunamis and uh, rationality. He says they're all part of being and the presupposed being. The kicker is, um, for him, he wants to say they have a life of his own, so you, their own. So you cannot understand the cosmos or nature or individual persons, yada, yada, uh, just by pointing to being and drawing conclusions about the infinite nature of being or its uh, character. Each of these, everything is both shares in being, 
but he says is also individual and has a character of its own. So th there's a part that connects to being and there's a, a part that, that's individual that you have to look at for itself and you can't understand anybody or anything simply by a reference to a whole. No, that, that's hard. It's very, I mean, if you push that, of course, it, it's nice to say that, but in a, how something could be both individual like that and part of an all-encompassing being um, it is something to look at. But, but that's the position he tries to explain and to defend. So re relatedness between the uh, and individuals. And related, related, yeah, relatedness for him, he talks about that a bit. Um, I don't remember. I, I think that there's something in me wants to say that he thinks all relationships are internal now, but I, I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may think some are external and some are internal. I'm sorry, I just don't remember. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, so I, I thought I was going to say to you that relationships were of both kinds, but uh -huh. I seem to remember something in, in BOR where he says that all relationships are internal, which is a hard position, but he may well take that. Uh -huh. Especially when he wants to say that everything goes and at least in part has, has things in a way of its own which he does want to see. With all of it, um, I guess what he does to, uh, is he kind of lumps together in a way which is partly appealing and partly not uh, the insights from all, all sorts of various philosophical approaches. And he kind of throws them together in this one whole. And they, uh, that's why I mentioned and why he's sensitive to charges of Occam's razor, because it, it seems like not so much of the system sometimes is just a hodgepodge of stuff. But but that that's kind of his effort is to say that there's both being and everything is part of being, um, but it's also individual. Yeah. And there's something very neoplatonic in what he does. In, I think, mm -hmm. uh, as I think he admits. But. So are the relationships between individuals by virtue of their common participation in being, or do they have some other kind of uh, relatedness? They have others. Hmm. Uh, because they all participate in being, but that, except, I mean, there, there's something I agree with him that it's important for that, but you don't want to make it more vacuous than it is. I mean, there's relationships within the physical world, of course, that are studied by science um, that you could say, if you like, the part of being, but you, that there's something more immediate as to what makes these relationships the way they are. So he doesn't say that every that, that there's room for other endeavors and activities where you, you capture the specific relationships of things to each other. Yeah. So um, I think my, my question is related to Ken's. Um, uh, at one point you um, talked about how sort of the social aspect of human beings and the sort of individual or personal aspect of human beings are for wise, like two sort of independent and separate orders of reality. But there are lots of other moments in your talk where it seems like the individual or personal really is the more important one for him. And, I, and, and so and I I'm, suspect also, it is. I'm also curious about how these two fit together. And I wonder whether this emphasis on the personal is not like one of the reasons he sort of fails in his, uh, when he faces up to Baldwin, because he can't. Without, without giving proper primacy to the social, he can't really like give good sort of structural social explanations. There's not that sort of ability to do that social power analysis that you need to both deal with racism and to address the kind of solidarity that one needs to uh, confront racism. You know, that, that's very possible because um, 
I think he realized that he didn't acquit himself entirely well with Baldwin, and the reason maybe had something to do with, uh, as he pretty well says in that quote I read after mm -hmm. discussing the Baldwin exchange, that he maybe didn't study that aspect of things as thoroughly as he might have. So, so that that could well be the case. Because he approached, as you know, Baldwin as an individual. I mean, during that discussion, he, he came out and uh, Baldwin had been talking about the, uh, the effect of racism and race in America. Mm -hmm. And the beginning of Weiss's talk was, you're an individual. Why do you talk about race all the time? Uh, because I agree it's important, and I agree that there's this terrible discrimination in America, but you're also a person, and you're an author, and if things were as exclusively racial as you seem to say they are, you would not have become, achieved recognition individually as the wonderful author that you are, which he, he does say, you know, <laughs> among other things. So yeah, Danny, you gotta he, watch this. He, <laughs> you wanna you wanna watch a really super liberal, <laughs> sympathetic person be completely destroyed by his own philosophy? That's what occurred, uh, uh, and on national television. <laughs> oh, I'm willing to watch it upstairs tonight. <laughs> no, but it's uh, it, I think you ought to watch all of the things where Weiss comes off as the smartest person in the room, and that happens a lot too. Uh, when I mean, there's a reason he was on television all the time. It's normally that didn't happen to him, <laughs> but as you said, he was speechless. Yeah, he was really caught. <laughs> he was really caught off guard. <clears throat> he had never really encountered somebody with the rhetorical crispness that James Baldwin carried. And believe me, Baldwin. He was Baldwin. Was he had mercy on? Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't mean to him. No, actually, there... The, he could have been much meaner than he was. The, the, there's quite a bit of respect there. Yeah, yeah, him, yeah, I think. yeah. I I don't... You know, Baldwin wasn't... Uh, he was well prepared for what he was going to say, but he didn't go any further than, than he had to, I think, to make his point. So if for those who haven't seen it, it's very easy to find on um, YouTube. Just take a few... Google James Weiss and uh, James Baldwin and Paul Weiss and come up. But you're right, maybe that he didn't do very well in talking about Baldwin because he wasn't fully aware of the social dynamic element of things. That's, that's a good point. To be fair, Weiss, I, I, it's hard it, it's hard to think of a long list of people who you know, would, put have, put, would have done well. <laughs> put in the position of, you go out there and argue with James Baldwin, yeah. who would have done very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I am so reminded of a, of an episode in, uh, in the All in the Family, in which Archie Bunker is talking with this young black man and makes a ca too casual a, a relation uh, a comment to him, that black, and the black kid immediately comes back at him that, you know, get him. I'm a man, I will be treated like a man. And, and Archie's like, sorry, sorry, I mean, he didn't, I'm like, I don't have to go, I don't go around always tell, telling about how I'm, I'm a man, and that's, and the kid replies back, that's because you've never had to. And that's such a trip, typical, I mean, it's my experience as well, never had to. Um, talking with a black, the first time, I said, the first time I really talked to the black kid was when I was in the army. And uh, Roots was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And he, he was as astonished at that I had no interest in my roots as I was that he had such intense in interest in it. And it became clear that, of course, I never had you to. Never had Whereas to. He, never had, he never had the chance. Mm -hmm. And Weiss is in the same position that so many of the other people my generation and older. And it just never crossed our mind until you sit down and actually talk with somebody, until you actually have that experience. Yeah, but you try not to do it on national television. Well, well, I don't know. There weren't many people would ask me on national television. I've heard that video. <laughs> no, he made, he made the ivory tower look just as out of touch as it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in some ways, uh, I think Weiss took it on the chin for everybody in the ivory tower because it was not Weiss's intention to be 
the ivory tower. He his intention was exactly the opposite. He thought he was engaged and you know on the ground. And, uh, you know, I have a friend know. that I sent that video to, mm -hmm. and her reaction was exactly she used exactly these words, mm -hmm. very very ivory tower approach. Of the privilege, which is so ironic mm -hmm. when you're talking about Paul Weiss. Be, yeah, he's he's the can't... absolute opposite of privilege. Yeah, and yet, I mean, there it is. <laughs> so, it's yeah. the way. And poor. The, the, yeah. There's some different yeah. way in which he handled his own background. I mean, he was a gutty kind of street kid. He's a street kid, yeah. Person. He didn't expect to be outdone by another street kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. and doing, yeah, Jeff. So Sabrina and I watched this video, what, about two years ago? Uh -huh. And actually I found the video because there was somebody I used to teach at Virginia Tech and there was somebody that I knew from Virginia Tech that was in the video, and which a minor role, and I thought, oh, that person's with James Baldwin, I've got to watch this video. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who Paul Weiss is, now you've <laughs> opened the world to me. But we're sitting here going, oh, we already saw this. This None. We saw this guy get demolished by Paul <laughs> Weiss. Right, and right. it was in such an illuminating way that we all felt, you know, I think all viewers feel, white viewers feel humiliated mm -hmm. by this. And and the, the reflection on what you said about all in the family, you know, mm -hmm. um, Two of us in the room w lived as children in the city where men had to walk around with a placard at a strike uh, picket line and so the sign on the placard yeah. said, I am, an, um, I am a man. Mm -hmm. And because they had to yeah. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the, make yeah. that point. Yeah, the, the man with this uh, garbage strike. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have been watching, I guess, a series of movies <coughs> about... Black Panthers, as well as the Baldwin film. Yeah, it's a, it's a moment. You know what? It's a funny thing that that should be Paul Weiss's legacy. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a, because, but the thing is, is people, most people will watch it the same way you did and go, oh my God, the Yale professor <laughs> just got destroyed <laughs> by the street kid. Um, but that Yale professor was a street kid, and the more you know, the more you go, if anybody should have been on his toes, it would have been Paul Weiss. And yet, that's what academia will do to you, hence the ivory tower thing. You, you come to think that the arguments that you're having in the ivory, ta ivory, ivory tower automatically have social implications, automatically have importance in the practical world. And it just isn't true. Or it, it is, is true. Extra it's work not, is required. It is true. It's just not true in the way you thought it was. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's true in the reverse. Um, it's that your irrelevance becomes the uh, becomes the, the object lesson. Um, anyway, more questions for Robin? We've got time for one more at least. Unless there isn't one more. More questions oh. for Paul Weiss. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Paul Weiss. Yes, you like. one. Uh, no. I can oh. read you a little. <laughs> I read Robert Cummings in the paper. Robert Cummings Neville. Robert Cummings Neville. Yeah. Right. Yeah. RCN. Yeah. Why is the student? By the way, yeah. anyway. Neville, Neville doesn't have that many nice things to say about, about Weiss. So. I, do, I don't really think so. No, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a good experience being his student. Wow. But I sent a draft of this paper to Neville, mm -hmm. and uh, I got a very nice, well, interesting response that I'll share part of what he says. Um, it is great to hear from you again and that you remember my comment on your paper. I am doing well, albeit approaching middle age. I'm 84, which was a cheery thing to say. Anyway, as to your paper, it is an excellent exposition of Weiss's view of philosophy as continued individual research. You are excellent, especially in short, how this works within his own writings, for instance, in your discussion of being and other realities. I do wish you would move not from philosophy to metaphysics, but from his metaphysical view 
to his philosophy of philosophy, which I tried to do. But he, of course, his philosophy moves both ways. This is part of what he means by systematic, but it would be good to bring this out. What would a Hegelian, for instance, say about this that is different? say about this that is different from what you say. So I think you again avoid saying whether Weiss is right. If someone were to challenge Weiss's view of philosophy, would you defend it by defending his pluralistic metaphysics? If you would not defend something like his pluralistic view, would you give up his theory of philosophy? Or is the connection between his metaphysics and philosophy much looser than you suggest. Um, so the short of it was he didn't really think I had answered the question that he had put to me when uh, I first presented the paper a couple years ago. That's a, that's a nice question. So what's your answer? Well, I thought, <laughs> I, thought I had done that by <laughs> distinguishing between his philosophy of philosophy or metaphilosophy, if you will, and his metaphysics, and saying that I thought there was a good deal to be learned from him throughout, but particularly in his metaphilosophy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'm sympathetic both to his view that there needs to be pluralism in philosophy, both pluralism as a philosophy, and pluralism in terms of a number of different approaches, each of which contributes something. Um, and I think he's valuable in, in pointing that out and in uh, pointing a direction to things. I, I, I wouldn't say that modern philosophy evolved is at all following Paul Weiss because it People are still, even those that do metaphysics, are, look, look at things much more closely and in detail than he does. He's very broad. But th there's something still I find very valuable in getting to know him and in reading this. Sabrina? When you read about that point in the course of your paper, I was thinking about our discussion the other day. Tuesday in the book discussion of Graeber when I was saying that we were it's our reading group in, this in fall, anthropology which the leading, there yeah. are it, there's the use of <coughs> various paradigms and uh, when I taught anthropology courses some years ago I made the point to people that you would effectively see the world in models. The brain doesn't take in all the information that could get you in the beyond seeing the world in models. And basically you need to kind of accept that and then you know try to apply laying out what you can gain from one model versus other information you can gain from a separate model and see what those overlays are and are there things that are common to each analysis are there things that aren't and why would that be and so it seems like there's a parallel in what Weiss is saying but in other uh, plural. philosophy speak yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's a, a pluralist yeah. Yeah. So. Possibly all the way down, but actually that's that's the question that has been circulating around here is there's a one in the many uh, yeah, he's uh, a issue. Yeah. But what the, the being yeah. thing adds a different dimension yeah. to that. You know. if he you're wants to have the best of both being, worlds, so yeah. to speak, of the monist and the mystic, mm -hmm. and also of the, the pluralist and the, uh, and the recognizer of differences mm -hmm. and the need for... Um, differentiating between things and studying and making distinctions. Yeah, some people say the mystic or the monist is just very lazy and overlooks. <laughs> so he, he really tries to for get everything in that he can. Can? Well, I, I guess I wasn't catching the metaphysical pluralism. It sounded 
uh, epistemological, because the way you're articulating was in terms of a multitude of ways of thinking and uh, so forth. But I didn't, I didn't catch the, the, the metaphysical pluralism. Well, when he talks about, you know, that, that's a fair question. I, I tried to say that these domains for him, he says they're ontologically distinct whatever that means. And um, so for him it is definitely a metaphysical pluralism. One way you might want to look at this, uh, any number of ways, you could see these different domains if you were an ordinary language philosopher, or a linguistic philosopher, perish the thought. You could say <laughs> that, that he is confusing different ways of talking about things with different ontological things in society. That is, you can talk about people in groups mm -hmm. and sociologically and pragmatically. You can talk about individuals looking into themselves. You can talk about physical science and you can talk about cosmology. So if, but if you want to be very hard headed about it, you can say these are four ways of speech, maybe, and that he's kind of reifying it and making it into entities, which might seem to me the way an analytic philosopher could get something worthwhile from this. Uh, because but, after all, they're masters of reification. Yeah, so, yeah. And some other ways, some people say that um, in the, the Weiss volume uh, that I took the uh, autobiography from, there is an article from uh, Sandra Rosenthal, who some of you know, who's a famous pragmatist philosopher. She says that a lot of what he says in his four domains can, can be reduced or can be restated, if you don't like the word reduced, in a very pragmatic approach. That pragmatism isn't limited, as Weiss would want to limit it, yeah. to uh, relations between people. You know, that you can, it goes broader than that. It goes all the way down, as she might say, and you could, could state what he has to say largely in a pragmatic tenor. Now, what did he say in reply? Well, of course, he's a curmudge. I mean, he disagreed, disapproved of it. Yeah, I'm no. sure he did. Yes. <laughs> and yet she was right. <laughs> Other questions? I think what we ought to do is maybe thank Robin and hang around for a while.